I mean, <laughs> is Young offensive? Hey, uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's panel. I'm Shweta Bhattapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, today, the topic of today's webinar is skills in the circular economy. We have Adam Reed, uh, who's moderating this uh, webinar. He's a director of external affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery. And recently, as of recently, he's also the president of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. And Adam is going to talk, talk to Katie Cockburn, who's a professional services director at CIWM, and Amy Bloom, assistant technical plant engineer at Suez Recycling and Recovery. And uh, thanks a lot for your uh, response, prompt response for our question when, as part of the registration. Adam has taken note of your responses, and the session is going to flow based on what you've told us. We also have some polls for you. And as usual, we will take your questions. Please use the Q&A section, and we will have the questions going. So over to you, Adam. Thanks very much, Shweta, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. This is it's always a very multicultural, multi-geographical audience on, on, on a Be Waste Wise webinar, so it's great to be back. It's been a little while since I did one. Um, fantastic panel, really looking forward to the discussion, and, and what a great topic. I mean, talking about the future, there's no, nothing better than talking about the future, is there? Because I can't be accused of getting it wrong. I can just be accused of being more inaccurate or less inaccurate. So um, I, I think we should have some fun in the next uh, 55 minutes or so. Um, can we pull up the slides, please, Sweater? Thank you, while I'm, while I'm chatting away. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with, with, uh, with Amy, who's going to give us a little bit of a pitch about uh, what she's up to. Uh, how she sees the future of her career and the kind of skills that she wants to develop, because I think that sets the sets the tone very nicely for where are the skills in the circular economy going to be and what and what are the needs of the workforce of tomorrow. Uh, then I'm going to pick up a little bit about my presidential theme for the year and why the chartered institution is looking at this and set it in the context of, uh, of COVID, amongst other things. And then we'll hand over to... Um, uh, to Katie to talk about some of the initiatives that she's leading at the moment in terms of ensuring that the workforces of tomorrow, both here in the UK and, and potentially wider afield, are as prepared as possible. So what do we need to ramp up for? What are we going to be doing? How do you get involved in that? And then hopefully we're going to have at least half an hour for some hardcore question and answers. So drop them in. Sweat has got a, a, a poll or two we can drop in as well to get your, your feedback. And, and hopefully it's as engaging and as, as relaxed as possible. So the more questions you throw at us, uh, the more questions we'll throw at the panel and, and we'll go in the directions that you want to go. But before then, a few quick, short, sharp uh, position pieces, if, if, if nothing else. So let's hand over to Amy. Welcome, Amy. How are you feeling today? Thank you, Adam. Or I should say Mr. President, shouldn't I? Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me today, guys. Uh, thank you for having me, Sweater, as well. Delighted to be a part of this panel on skills for the circular economy. And um, just going to run through, like Adam said, a bit about me, my background, um, what skills I'm looking at for the future and my dreams for this sector, really. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So my background, uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, I come from a chemical engineering background. I studied uh, up to master's at university and part of this was um, a placement sandwich year, which meant I got to get hands on and dirty in an engineering setting. Um, and my final year, I undertook a master's research project. My research project looked at uh, using pyrolysis oils to power large marine vessels such as cargo ships or ferries. And, and this was the first point really for me where I realized that waste is a resource in the wrong place. And I was hooked by that idea and I still am. Also during my last year at university, I became a STEM ambassador. So STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths. And at an event for STEM ambassadors, I was lucky enough to bump into um, a future colleague of mine who advised me of jobs that were going at Suez. Um, I applied, I was successful, and I've never looked back. I've been at Suez ever since. Next slide, please. My experience so far then, like I said, I've been at Suez R&R, so that's recycling and recovering in the UK since I graduated. And since the start of the lockdown in March 2020, I've been an assistant technical plant engineer at a household waste management site with anaerobic digestion and energy from waste processes. 
but outside of um, prior to my secondment, I was a business improvement specialist working with industrial and commercial manufacturers, evaluating challenging waste streams for them and uh, looking to create more circular um, solutions or moving them up the waste hierarchy or eliminating them entirely. This has these these experiences and my time at Suez has been enabled me to have great um, breadth of experience. I've worked in hazardous industrial, commercial and residential waste, um, which has been a, a huge asset to me, understanding the challenges of different aspects of our industry. Outside of work, I have recently become an ex-expedition uh, ambassador. So this is a charity that looks at um, micro, the effect of microplastics in our oceans and the impacts on our communities, both local and globally, and how we can turn off the tap. Um, and I completed the Arctic virtual voyage with them. So unfortunately didn't get to sail because of the pandemic, but it was a hugely uh, worthwhile experience nevertheless. Finally, and looking forward for me, I'm. I've been accepted onto the Ellen MacArthur Foundation from Linear to Circular course uh, coming up over the next few months. And those pictures on the side there are just different days of my uh, of my job. It's okay, so I thought you can move on. Thank you, though. You don't always wear high vis, do you, Amy? Um, my high vis now is beautifully yellow. Um, and actually, that's that's my favourite part of the job. I love getting out behind my desk and I love getting on site. Just getting getting hands on um so it's uh, it's certainly been warm and smelly during this uh, this heat wave we've been having that's for sure <laughs> um so where what skills do i want um, and do i see working forward um sorry moving forward working in this sector well i'm sure all of you know uh, but it it's evolving our sector is evolving at a great pace and i think it's a really exciting time for us to be working in it there is so much positive um actions taking place and there are great um it's great awareness and great momentum i really feel like sort of the the future of our industry is very very exciting so i've come from a stem background and those skills that i learned at university and through that have been central to my career development and i've been able to adapt my skills uh, from that into maybe not as heavy engineering roles but i think that we all will have to adapt our skills moving forward if we are to um, meet the changing needs and understand the changing requirements that are the communities we serve and the waste that they generate makes and um, because there are going to be scientific and technical challenges to understanding different materials and different systems that we'll be working within we then i think communication skills as we transition into a circular economy will be critical both internally within our sector and between sectors but also communicating changes um, to to customers to communities to um to, to the wider population and to communicate effectively we need um, strong data analysis and representation so we can build stories and show truly the baseline that we are working from and where we're working towards finally i think it's going to be critical for the skills in the circular economy that we have public engagement as i've already highlighted but also legislation understanding there's going to be a big change um, i mean in the uk alone we have um drs coming in and people when they understand what sector we work in they're going to have questions we might not have all the answers but i think it's really important that we um we take the steps to understand how our job impacts people. Next slide, please, Swetha. So talking about skills um, and experiences, where do I see our sector evolving or where would I like to see our sector evolve uh, moving forward? I've touched a lot on a, a couple of these items already, but the first one I think is so important is collaboration, working outside of siloistic thinking not only between sectors so working for example for us working with designers working with people upstream to create products that we can effectively recapture redesign and put back into this back into the system 
but also globally. We need to collaborate and share the skills that we have, we have honed within our own countries, within our own areas, to countries that are developing. I mean, um, between 2009 and 2030, the average middle class is um, expected to raise, rise from 1.8 to over 5 billion people with 88% of those um, that rising middle class and that wealth coming from Asian countries. Now these are countries that have typically not have had reliable or a regular waste collections and um, with that increasing wealth there's going to be um, greater uh, income, greater purchasing power and as a response it could lead to greater waste so we need to act before uh, we react to any problems that could happen as a result as a kind of an add-on to that if we're creating waste in the country i really strongly believe we should be able to manage the waste in in-house um, because unfortunately i the future of our sector, I don't want it to be talking, still be talking about illegal waste uh, shipments abroad or, you know, shipments abroad that are illegal but may not be morally what we are all working towards. Because for me, I got into the sector because I care about the environment and from talking to others, they share that too. If we're going to share this uh, knowledge, um, though, I think engagement and diversity in our sector needs to yeah, really come up. And I know that in the UK, I know Adam's been involved in um, engage, uh, increasing diversity workshops in our Chartered Institute. Um, and there's so many business cases for these two items. I won't go into them now, but I would love to see a more diverse and engaged workforce. But I don't think that would be a problem because like I said, engagement in the environmental issues is especially for us here since Blue Planet 2 has been greatly magnified and there's a lot more visibility what going on in our sector which is again one a sector that is fully transparent and making sure that we're making changes that are tangibly and effectively green we're not selling the public or we're not working with people who are selling the public an idea that may be in I don't know five ten years time we realize we're actually doing more harm than good and finally, my last point for today is I want to see a world where energy from waste is minimised. Now, I appreciate it's a really important technology, a transition technology, and maybe this might be controversial, but I can see Adam laughing. Um, but, you know, we will always have a residual waste stream. So energy from waste is going to always be there. But increasing uh, our investment in this over long time periods we are already on borrowed time we are running out of time before 2030 and 2050 we cannot continue to invest in carbon intensive um, industries when our streams of waste that we're making will inevitably be changing that's uh, that's everything from me thank you Swetha and uh, um, I'll hand back over to Adam thanks thanks Amy if you just keep going with a slide sweater, I, I, Amy, fascinating journey. Always, always enjoy talking to you about where you've been, where you're going, what you think is important. Um, I agree with a lot of that stuff. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that, you know, there you are sort of engineering, hard science background. You're now doing stuff that's, that's more be behavioral because you're working with schools. But at the same time, you've gone, I need to understand the circular economy, hence the Ellen MacArthur. I mean, if if you can't get the right skills base over the next five years to, to, to be, you know, critical in that transition of, of waste to resources, then then none of us are going to be, you know, skilled appropriately. So, um, I, I, you know, I, th I think we should track your career with um with interest. Thank you. I'll come back. I've got some questions for you in a moment, but let's let's crack on because we get my slides out of the way because, you know, they're, they're boring. Um, so my presidential theme, I've been a president of the CIWM here in the UK now for for all of four weeks. Um, and and but I've been talking about skills, uh, not so much about the circular economy, but skills in our sector for far longer than that. So if we go for the next slide, please. I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of context because I, I needed a theme for my presidential year. And whilst walking across Chelsea Bridge, on my way to go and look at a venue for hosting my presidential event, which has been curtailed by COVID, of course. Um, I was thinking about my career and I was thinking about all the people that had helped me and the mentoring that had happened and CIWM's role in giving me 
peer to peer learning opportunities and the groups that we created as 20 year olds, you know, wanting to change the world and who was going to help us? Well, we're going to help ourselves. So we created our own kind of network. And now we're all, you know, senior managers in our own rights, changing the world. Absolutely. So well done, everyone. But I think when I look at it, I, I realize that they are, uh, our sector has evolved so much. I came into it when it was 90% landfill. I came into it when it was recycling rate of 5%. Now look at us, you know, Suez has got what, four landfill sites. We, we currently recover energy from nigh on 50% of the material we handle, you know, recycling 45% of everything we handle. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable transition in, in what is only half of my career, not all of my career. So I suddenly thought, well, transition of the sector, circular economy being one of those, but Brexit being another key driver at the moment. And then we had the pandemic which has really created an opportunity for us to evolve what we do and how we do it it, it just became obvious that, that thinking about skills of tomorrow and how we as a chartered institution and as professionals um, help enable that would be an obvious place to start next slide please uh, and why are skills so important well if we don't if we don't train people properly both at school but then post-school you know, whether it be university or on the job, then we just have the wrong people do, with the wrong skill set to deliver the kind of economic boom that everybody seems to think and, and is hoping that we can get in terms of green recovery. So if you look at transition to the online during, during COVID, so much has happened in the last 18 months. You know, we, we never ran online events that often. And now everybody runs online events, not as well as B Waste Wise and CIW, of course, but everybody has a, has a go at this. And, and, and I think, you know, online training has become far more the norm. And I'm sure Katie will mention that when she gets a chance. Uh, but I think not only is the circumstances change, but you then look at the kind of skills that people want. And the, the World Economic Forum produced an unbelievable report not that long ago, looking at you know, some of the kind of changing environment in which we're in and problem solving skills and self management skills, you know, your resilience or your ability to learn and develop, you know, how to work with people, collaborative stuff, exactly what Amy's talked about, communication. And actually, technology, it's not necessarily about weird and wonderful tech that you're going to like buy a big you know, carbon capture storage unit, it's more the technology that enables you to work on the fly and to, you know, deliver online training and things like that. So we, we're seeing an unbelievable change in the, in the need and dynamics of skills needed between now and 2025 and 2030 more generally. And, and that rate of change, I can't see changing. I, if only, if anything, getting faster. Next slide, please. So that's my context is we've got to get the skills right now because Two years from now, when all of this starts to get delivered, all of that policy reform that Amy mentioned, if we haven't got the people in the right place at the right time, then we're going to have the wrong material in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's just a pain. So whether you're in a transition economy or a low income location, whether you're high income or not, you're all going to be facing transition changes that need you to have a different set of skills. It's not about can I move waste to a landfill site? That's so last century. Now, look at these figures again. From, these came out of um, the same World Economic uh, Forum report. 50% of all employees, we need reskilling by 2025. 50%. Half of everybody that you're in charge of today is going to need to be reskilled by 2025. But that's like a blink. That's like, oh, I missed it. So what are you doing in your, in your workplace to ensure that your staff, your workforce of today are already being reskilled? And what are you doing as an individual? Do you know what you want to be reskilled as? How, how, what skills gaps have you got? These are questions you need to be thinking about. And then you think about reskilling skills, 40% on the same, same report of current workers' core skills, core skills, not marginal skills, not nice to have, core, are expected to change in the next five years. So the things that you do today as the norm might not be there tomorrow. So again, are you taking ownership as an individual? Are you as an organization already preparing for a workforce of 2025 and 2030? Because if you're not, you're going to miss the boat. You're going to be marginalized. And I think that, you know, I talked about dinosaurs in my presidential presentation. I worry about some people, businesses and organizations becoming dinosaurs quickly in a sector that is evolving. And let's be honest, I get challenged all the time. Adam, why do you talk about circular economy? You're a waste manager. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a waste manager, but I'm actually a resource manager. And resource managers are all about the circular economy. I'm all about repair. I'm all about refill. I'm all about waste prevention. Just because I manage infrastructure that treats residual waste, but that's because society isn't effective in managing its resources. My job is to help us drive up the hierarchy and be much more circular. So I have no, I'm not threatened by circular or repair or, or minimization. I shouldn't be. I should embrace those and so should you. Next slide, please. 
Now, when we when we mapped this out, so I, I had some consultants doing some work for me. It was a brilliant piece of work led by Sarah Jane Widdison, who will be speaking at the next Be Waste Wise webinar, I believe, Sweater, um, on another topic, of course. Uh, we, we, we realized that we were, we were morphing through a number of different economies here in the UK, and actually Western Europe's looking quite similar. So the recycling economy is the one today that we're living in. But then we're going to move to the resource economy. Well, what the hell is the resource economy? Then it's more circular, and that's when you start having less resource but it's designed to go round and round and round hence you don't buy product you buy service which is quite a big step change for most consumers my mum included to get her head around but the real goal of 2030 and beyond is to become a carbon economy all our decisions are based around carbon and other emissions and therefore we may change the materials that we use the packaging we may change the decisions we make about how we how we you know how we move where we live what we shop and actually I see our job, resource managers of tomorrow, being all about enabling the carbon economy, which means we need to understand a lot bigger issues than just sustainability. We need to be much more embracing of these new issues and new language. And I think that's the direction of travel. I want my dustmen, you know, the frontline waste collectors of today to be the resource managers of tomorrow, which means they need to be comfortable having a conversation with a resident about why they're buying that kind of packaging. Whoa, that sounds like a huge transition. I don't think it is. I think that's exactly the kind of transition we need to have. So interesting times. Next slide, please. Now, thank you, audience, for all of your feedback about your big concerns about skills and competencies. I've tried to summarize them, and I, you have to give me some leniency here because you all use different words and different phrases, and I've tried to box them into some, some similar thinking. But the, the overriding, overriding themes are at the bottom, the big numbers. Communication, education, and behavior change. Well, well done, Amy, because you, you've already acknowledged that that's one of your ones. Circular economy and non-linear systems. Well, Amy had that one too, so she's doing well because you hadn't seen this because I only got this last night. Data, better data, better data management, the use of data, empowering better decision-making. Eco design, triple bottom line and life cycle analysis, that whole cradle to grave approach to making decisions about products and packaging and material types. They stood out as recurring themes. And then there's a whole range of other things that you're all going to go, well, that's interesting for me. So whether it be collaborative working, Amy had that one, source segregated collections, if you're interested in recycling, flexibility and change management is one that always comes up in every conversation I have. How do I get my team to work differently? Great question. Um, reducing resource consumption, improving commodity markets, and right at the top there, how do we link academia with the real world so we get research that has real impact for local solutions, and finally, repair and refill, because we can't evolve into a higher on the hierarchy system without understanding how repair and refill systems are going to work, because suddenly the packaging chain changes, the materials in your bin changes. So huge amount of opportunity there, I think. Thank you very much for your feedback. Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over to Katie because I set Katie uh, as a CIWM you know, director the task of coming up with a plan for how CIWM was going to work on the skills agenda because I don't want a report that sits on a shelf and look nice for 12 months. I want the, the institution to be bravely embarking on, a, on, a, on a, a new agenda, which is how do we build the skills of our current workforce, but also the skills of the workforce that we need in 2030 and who do we work with and how do we make this happen and, and you know what are the issues we're going to have to solve in the short term to enable that, that journey to happen so I'm going to welcome Katie to the floor with a terribly big ask so Katie how are you? Um, absolutely fine and not daunted at all Adam by that Good. task. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here thanks Adam thanks Swetha for having me and, and really excited to to work out how we can meet that challenge that, that you've given us, Adam, and make sure that we support the sector for the skills needs for the future. Um, you can go to the first slide, please, Swetha. Um, so one of the things that was really clear in the presidential report that, that was prepared with Adam and with Sarah Jane, and actually one of the things that has already been clear today is that we are not going to achieve a circular economy if we work in silos as sectors. Um, this is going to require intersectoral and interdisciplinary um, collaboration. It, it cannot work without it. Um, these are the key sectors that were identified as part of that report. Um, and you can see they're ones that I don't think will be a surprise to anyone. Materials and chemicals, design, producers, manufacturers, clearly, um, logistics, transport, IT. But actually, all areas of the supply and value chains really need to be on board in this change if we're going to um, make it work for 2050. 
So if we push one ahead. Um, now, what skills do those people need? Um, and yes, Amy definitely came up with a lot of these all, all picked up again um, by our attendees today in that poll session. And the key themes that were coming up here um, are ones that are not going to be a surprise to anybody. Uh, but what's really important is that we make sure that as CRWM, we recognise within our knowledge framework each of these skills and who needs it at what level. So um, it's, it's, it's great to talk about circular economy, data information, communications and behaviour change, but different people at different levels of an organisation are going to need different levels of these skills. Um, different nuances of the skills are going to need to access access those skills in different ways um, and so we need to think about that but also put that in a framework um, that allows us to identify who and and what information is needed so if we move one slide along please Feta. um so and uh, one of the big things that we can't do is leave this piece of research alone, walk away from it, tell ourselves we now know. Um, we've recognised that change management is going to be an important part of the future, and we need to make sure that we keep on top of that, that future looking um, approach. So at CRWM, we're developing a Skills for the Future working group. Um, this will be a dedicated group to oversee skills mapping. Uh, we're developing the knowledge framework now based on the research that has been produced in Adam's presidential report, but that won't be enough to see us through to 2025, let alone 2030. Um, and so each year we will be bringing a future a skills for future working group together. We talk about um, what future, what future skills we're going to need, what skills we need now, where we are with those skills, um, and to continually hone and refine the work that has already been done to make sure that we're moving, that we're agile and that, as Amy pointed out, that we're adaptable because that's something that we're all going to need to be. Um, so we're looking for membership across the waste and resource management value chain. Um, absolutely, if you're if you're interested in that membership, please do get in touch with me. Um, in terms of responsibility, this is a working group and these people will be expected to contribute uh, with their insight from the sector and our aligned sectors. Um, you know, their understanding of the, the needs for their organisation so that we can understand what that wider need is. Um, and the impact of that is going to be that CLWM product, um, training products, events, workshops, webinars, uh, partnerships are all going to be informed by this knowledge framework and knowledge plan that we will have uh, to get us to 2025, 2030 and beyond. So in terms of that knowledge framework then and picking up all of those six skills that were identified in terms of sector skills, we've pulled out some, some key headings. Uh, so business skills, including things like entrepreneurship, including uh, contract management. Um, sadly, I have seen really good high quality refuse derived fuel going to landfill because the contracts weren't in place to handle um, handle where it goes next and so those business skills are, are going to be really critical to a circular economy. Um, core waste and resource management skills, we're going to need people to understand legislation, I think this is something that Amy picked up as well, uh, we do need those core technical um, skills, things around health and safety and compliance are going to be really important. Um, sustainability and circular economy skills, so understanding systems thinking, understanding the changes in um, material design, the changes that that will have uh, financially even, um, interpersonal and behavioural skills, absolutely critical because if we can't um, engage with the public and have everyone understand the importance of circular economy, then again, we're not going to get there. So it's going to be really important that people at all levels of an organisation can influence the people that they come into contact with. Um, so things around influencing, around resilience, um, things that are often called soft skills, uh, which I think is a bit of a bit of a name for it because actually these these skills are really hard <laughs> these are these are people skills and they can be really difficult and they're difficult to train um, but absolutely we have a responsibility and um, and a need to make sure that we get these skills across in our workforces uh, management and leadership skills are going to be critical we need good change managers we need people who can uh, be credible leaders that other people will want to follow and we need to know how to build that in our sector and of course professional standards and ethics and I think Amy mentioned around equality and diversity that's going to be critically important but also um, sort of understanding the responsibilities that we have as corporations corporate social responsibility I think is going to be a big part of consumer decision making 
um, and we need to make sure that we're at the heart of that as well. So this knowledge framework will build out for across all of these skills um, and will effectively give us a framework for developing um, content uh, that will be useful to the sector and to align sectors to ensure that we can we can provide access to upskilling for the workforce. Next slide, please, Swetha. OK, so how 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 are we going to do this? Um, of course, the uh, the skills for the future working group is going to be critical. But once we've got the what, once we understand what we need, we need to devise ways of, of producing that and developing it so that it can be easily accessed. Um, we need to think about how we link those skills to career, career progression routes um, how we can link them to different role types. Um, we need to think about how we provide them. So, yes, we have definitely seen an increase in, uh, in online learning over the course of the pandemic. That's definitely been a catalyst to it. Um, and we will see enhanced online learning going on. I think in the CRWM membership survey, we saw almost 80% of people wanting to access their learning online. But it's really important that we have high quality online learning. No one wants that click through e-learning experience, which is not engaging, um, which is not something you want to repeat necessarily. Uh, we need to make sure that we have lots of um, engaging interesting content and actually that we modularize content that we break it down into small bite-sized chunks which can build upon each other um, to develop uh, sort of high quality credentialed um, learning that that we can trust going forward but that we can access very easily um, equally i think the classroom will continue and we'll look at blended learning approaches as well um, and I think the important thing here is how are we going to pay for all of this? Funding definitely came up in that in that slide that Adam showed us of your comments. And we need to think about how we're going to be funding this learning. 50% of the workforce needing reskilling by 2025, who pays? Um, we need to think about uh, how we can access things like apprenticeships, uh, whether there's opportunities for funded qualifications, how we can use the government's uh, certainly in the UK, the government's lifetime skills guarantee um, to encourage people to take up additional learning. We need to think about bursaries. Um, and also we need to think about making sure that the learning that we do provide is as cost effective as possible using things like uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, all of these things can mean that we don't have people off site for long periods of time, that we don't have them out of the workforce, um, that we're accessing things quickly, and that can all reduce cost and therefore improve the funding proposition for learning going forward. Thanks, Swetha. Um, and then okay, uh, clearly we need to think globally. Um, so we need to think about where we've got qualifications that are useful for our sector. We need to make sure that we map those to uh, qualifications across the globe. Um, we need to think about how the UK qualifications framework fits with the EU qualifications framework, and that, that will obviously have been impacted by Brexit. Um, we need to make sure that we have some form of recognition and comparability, and I think professional bodies can have a really high impact in that area. Um, and the only way we can do that, of course, is by working in partnership. Um, as I said, we need to look at government funding, and we also need to look at opportunities for funded developments globally. Um, looking at how we can work together with other nations to, to almost develop an, a, a global standard um, where we can and how professional bodies can get involved to, to drive that. Um, and I think innovation hubs is going to be a big part of, of how we achieve that. Next slide, Swetha. Um, but we're not going to achieve all of this on our own. <laughs> Clearly, that's a big challenge from Adam, and we absolutely accept it. But in recognition of the fact that we need to, we need to work in partnership with other people. Um, professional bodies need to come together with aligned sectors. Uh, for example, you know we would be looking to work with professional bodies who lead in the area of HR, people who are leading the area of management and leadership. All of those things are going to be critically important with trade associations, with training providers. I think one of the key things that terrifies me when I hear 50% of the workforce need to be um, reskilled by 2025 is where is the infrastructure from this coming from? Who is going to be doing that teaching? Um, you know, who's going to be providing that learning? And we need to make sure we're working with training providers and employers to, to get to build capacity. Um, and also with corporate businesses, you know, we need to make sure that we're bringing everyone on board wherever we can. Uh, and we need to lead where we are experts. We need to own that space. 
Um, but we also need to recognise where we're not experts. And in those spaces, we absolutely need to partner with others to make sure that we can offer a, you know, a complete service to our sector and also to our aligned sector. And that's it from me. Quick whistle, very whistle stop tour. Thanks, Kate. I mean, there's so much going on. It's, uh, it's, it's very exciting times. Um, and apologies for setting such a big ask, but you know, if we don't ask for the for the moon, we you know we will never get there, will we? Um, so let's have a couple of questions, and then we'll maybe ask a poll question in a moment. But um, so let's start with, with with you, Amy. I mean, clearly long career panning out in front of you. I mean, do you feel threatened that you're a waste manager, and it, by 2030, 2040, there's not going to be any waste to manage? I mean, uh, how are you adapting, or what's what's the plan? I uh, no, I don't. I don't feel threatened. Similar to what you said earlier, I feel you know it's so exciting. We have a, we work in a sector that has the ability to make an actual change, to make a positive environmental issue and cr change our consumption and our disposal habits. So no, I'm not um, threatened at all. I feel challenged, but in a good way. It's a good challenge. I feel yes. excited. And 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 and, and Katie. All these opportunities for, for retraining, reskilling. I'm thinking about setting up a business. Um, uh, is that is that a good plan? Yes, um, <laughs> I, think, I think there's definitely space there for people with the right mindset to deliver high quality training. I think um, you know we are going to be looking for people with a whole range of skill sets. Uh, but we want the best. Um, so it's really important that if you're going to be setting up a training provider, you make sure that you're absolutely at the top of your game, that you're delivering what we need, because uh, absolutely that's what we're going to be looking for. We want next generation skills. Um, we don't want what we've always had. Um, so, Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll take the challenge back. Um, <laughs> I, I'm interested in the global nature, given the audience we've got. You know, it's not it's not purely CIW members here in the UK. So, so you know, Amy, you you've got an interest in 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 plastics pollutions around the world, and you know, you've you've expressed an interest in the circular economy. I mean, can we collaborate effectively on upskilling for tomorrow, or or is each geography just too unique and the circumstances too difficult? Oh, that's a good question, Adam. <laughs> um, I think obviously we cannot, um, yes, geographies are very different. We can't assume that our solutions um, in here in the UK are going to work effectively um, in the same way in a different geography, but I think it'd be incredibly short-sighted of us to assume that we can't share any sort of knowledge with each other. Um, and okay, in the UK, we have a very established resource management sector, but I also think we need to learn from other geographies who are doing things maybe in areas that we can de develop in. So yeah, I think there's huge scope for collaboration. Um, and I think the move to digital like, online during the pandemic has been a real great um, enabling factor to help us collaborate yeah. more across, ge across geographies. Try saying that quickly. I, I do a lot um, as a geographer. Um, Katie, um, working globally, clearly, you know, I, I have a passion for, for global resource management, having spent, you know, 10 years of my, my early career traveling the world when carbon wasn't quite the concern that it was that it is today, helping develop strategies and pilot projects. And, you know, I had a great experience, but, but learned quickly that politics doesn't work the same overseas and geography is not the same and economic models don't seem to resonate. So a lot of what gets, you know, morphed from here or all Western Europe, to, to, to elsewhere suddenly starts to get lost in translation. How, you know, ISWA is an obvious starting point for CIWM. You know, we're a, we're a signed up bona fide member of ISWA and so therefore there's lots of collaboration. Um, but are there, you know, are there other institutions or organizations globally that we've already got an eye on that are gonna be, you know, potential partners or, 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 or are gonna share some of the journey with us? Um, I think we've certainly been speaking to more organisations globally than we perhaps would have if we hadn't had the uh, catalyst of the pandemic driving that sort of uh, online discussion. Um, and we're perhaps receiving three or four queries a month um, from organisations who are wanting us to work with them in terms of uh, how, how, we, how we support globally. But I think 
at the moment for us it's about making sure we have the right strategy understanding where perhaps markets are similar to ours understanding um, as you said the politics in the area understanding um, you know how we can support and how we can collaborate are going to be really important and I think until we've got that international strategy in place so that we can do things in a really um, sort of structured and proactive way um, I don't think we're, we're necessarily ready for that at the moment but we are absolutely speaking to people globally good part, part, part of the journey and those of you that are pinging stuff in the chat great don't worry Katie's contact details will be available in the slide deck afterwards drop her a note if you want to collaborate I'm already feeling quite excited about some of these organizations that want to get involved so that's fantastic um Tell me about repair a, a little bit. So if I, I gave evidence to the Environment Audit Committee not that long ago about the upskilling of our sector. And I said we needed something like 30,000 repair specialists in the next five years. And I think the, the, the Audit Committee took one look at me and thought I might be slightly barking mad, but let, 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 let's revisit that. I mean, 30,000 repair specialists, that's a lot of sheds and a lot of people tinkering in the garage. That's not what we mean when we, when we mean 30,000 you know, repair specialists. We're talking about you know, new skills, new standards, you know, up to speed information and data about your latest I, you know, iPhone or your Samsung Galaxy or whatever it might be. I mean, they need to be kept abreast. Is that something that CIWM can work with others on to keep the information flows of what's important today in terms of products and, and packaging, et cetera? That's for you, Katie. Yeah, definitely. And I think recently CRWM has invested not only in its professional services team, but also in its policy knowledge and technical teams. And I think the critical thing for us now is going to be that sort of virtuous learning cycle. So making sure that where we are um, advising and taking part in consultations and working with people on how we move this forward, that we're then also talking to our membership and the wider sector about our position on these things and that we're producing content, learning content based on these um, on these position statements. So I think, um, yes, absolutely, there'll be opportunity for us to, to contribute to that. Fabulous. Uh, quick question for you, Amy. Um, is carbon capture and storage realistic? It's a bit technical, but I thought you were the technical one on the panel. Um, yes, I, you know, I believe it is when used in collaboration um, with our energy from waste sites. I know, for example, that uh, Suez in the northeast of England in Teesside has signed up to a memor memorandum of understanding um, regarding one of its lines and one of its sites to investigate carbon capture and storage. When you look at any sort of modelling about um, sort of environmental issues, carbon capture and storage is plays a significant role. Even if we turned off the carbon tap tomorrow, we've still got to deal with all the emissions yep. that are out there. Good. We've not talked a lot about technical skills. A lot of this has been about change, collaboration, entrepreneurial, but you know, clearly our sector still has technical needs. I mean, are, are we underplaying the technical needs of our sector, Katie, or, or are they just not come out from the work thus far? I think they were almost a given in the work that's gone on thus far. I think what we were looking at is what additional skills are we going to need? Um, and, you know, we already have a core set of skills in terms of the qualifications offer from WAMITAB and the, the learning and development offer, the training offer from CRWM. We're covering a lot of those core skills in that. So I think really we were looking at how do we broaden that out to make sure that we're not just focusing on technical skills, but we're also focusing on the whole range of skills that are going to be needed to get us where we need to be. Fabulous. Amy, you, you, obviously support technical skills as well as the the more rounded you know softer stuff wouldn't you yes um yes i would i think the, the mix of the both is critical um as i've said we need to be able to communicate these skills out there into the communities i think it's interesting I, I was part of the um new next technology new technology demonstrator program back in the uk what 15 years ago when we were trying to move away from landfill and we had to prove that some of these other technologies like mbt and gasification worked or didn't and and there was a big training program put alongside them because it wasn't just about creating a technology it was about creating an appreciation and understanding of what their decisions would be so somebody's asked a question about are we training politicians i'm not i'm not sure i i, I get paid enough to train politicians but i i do think we have to train decision makers and politicians are a group of decision makers but that course was fascinating in that we talked about the technology we talked about the planning the siting the, the feedstocks and yet most of those technologies actually ended up failing to deliver. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's quite an interesting, you know, we put a lot of money into training for tomorrow. And in the end, the technical stuff failed, not, not, not the soft stuff, but interesting insight. Um, somebody's offering to do a pilot in Greater Manchester about skilling up for, um, for a uh, circular economy. Yeah, email me afterwards. I'm, I'm already loving that idea. Um, we've got a big reuse program in, in Greater Manchester already, as Sue is. Um, so I, I really want to talk about that afterwards. Thanks very much. Um, can, we, can we do a poll question, Sweater? So let's, let's, let's get the audience to give us a quick, quick snapshot um, on a hot topic, and then we'll, uh, we'll get my two experts to, to share their thoughts on, um, on, on a topic. What are we gonna, what, what we got for them? Okay, uh, we'll launch the self-assessment. So here we go. Simple question, boys and girls. Where would you say you stand in your current understanding of the circular economy? So we've done a lot of talk around it. We talked about the skills we might need and how we might get it. But, you know, what are you at the moment? I don't know anything. That's why I joined the webinar. I'm a beginner. It's a self-assessment. I'm a practitioner, or I would say I'm an expert. Uh, quick vote. I don't want to hold you up very long. Um, but Amy, what would you describe yourself as? You know what I would say? I'm somewhere between, this is not great for the poll question, somewhere between a beginner and a practitioner because, you know, the more I learn, the more I realise that, you know, there is more to learn. And um, touching back on your uh, technology uh, event 15 years ago about coming out of landfill, there's going to be so, it's so important for us to innovate um, out of this, you know, into the circular economy. It's, you know, the whole part of, a whole part of innovation is there are things that don't go out how you want them to but if we didn't know that we wouldn't be where we are today Absolutely. so i don't like the word failure when it comes to technology i just feel like it's pointing in a sort of different direction yeah yeah we can learn from from the, the, the journey, can't we go on in sweater yeah. what's the answers and then we get we get cake oh look at this 50 percent beginner 39 percent a practitioner i'd have said i'm a practitioner but a practitioner with lots of room for learning um, because I do do it some of the time, but not all of the time. And, and I suppose that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? You can only do what you can, you know, what you can control, if you like, at the time. And it's not always, that's not always easy, is it? Um, Katie, what do you think about that, that poll result? Uh, expected, unexpected? Yeah, I think fairly expected. I, I'm sort of glad to see people saying that they're, you know, you know 50% of people saying that is, is a good thing, because I think and we, I like that we're at that stage of the learning cycle where we've reached conscious incompetence, where we know that we don't know the things we need to know <laughs> to do the next stage. So I think um, I'm sort of glad to see that most people will put themselves in the beginner bracket. And I think that means that there's more work for us in terms of, um, you know, understanding what it is that we need to know as a sector, but also understanding what other sectors need to know and how we can influence them. Um, yeah, no, that's a good point. I, 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 I think one of my big themes for the next 12 months is the collaborative piece, because I think for our sector to be as front and central to the green revolution that, that, that everybody's talking about post post COVID uh, pandemic, we we need to be seen to be providing the feedstocks that green chemistry, the feedstocks that green agriculture, the green stocks that feed remanufacturing, the green feedstocks, and the list goes on almost, doesn't it? Um, and yet, when you ask people about what's our role, you, you, don't, you don't hear that. We're, we're, the, we're the engine room of greening somebody else. They go, oh, you've got a load of burners or you use landfill sites. And I, and I think there's, we need to change the perception of our sector to one that's about resources in the right place at the right time, to use Amy's analogy. Um, and I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge, because if we can be seen to be part of the engine room for some of these other sectors, then maybe we'll actually get a mention at COP um, in November, because at the moment I can't see resource efficiency or waste management anywhere in that agenda. And yet, how, how are these other sectors greening themselves without us? I mean, it's just, you know, it seems to be madness. But anyway, I, I'm on my hobby horse. Can we have the next poll, please, Sweater? And then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up these final few questions that have been bouncing around. We have got one more poll, haven't we? So we're interested in how we're going to get the skills um, over the next five years. Well, you can pick two of these. So where would you go? Are, are you thinking academic? or vocational training, or you thinking it's more about my mentoring, my coaching, my ad hoc support group. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it by volunteering. I'm going to go and be a volunteer somewhere to get some experience of, of take back schemes or deposit return or reuse or whatever it might be. Or if it's something else, 
tick the box and then ping it in the chat function. Let me know what the other thing, if there's another avenue that I've not thought about, if this expert panel doesn't know about it, and we need to know about it. So vote on your, your favorite two and then we'll, uh, we'll get the, uh, the, uh, the panel to wrap up in a, in a few moments. So vote away. Um, Katie, you know, you're all about academic stroke vocational training. That's your kind of bread and butter, isn't it? I mean, that's not the only route to, to, to skills gaps closure, is it? Absolutely not. No, and I think it's it's one of those things where it really is horses for courses. It's about understanding how you learn best. It's under, about understanding what the opportunities for learning are, um, and it's about making the most of those. And I think one of the things that that people do is they say, "Right, I'm going to go on a course, and that's going to teach me." And then they'll write down in their CPD that they've done seven hours because they've done that course and that's off. A really important thing is about the reflective learning. So when you think back on that course and say, "Okay, what?" On that was new to me what did I learn and how am I going to apply it next when I go to work or when I'm in a meeting or when I am engaging with people or when I'm making decisions you know, how am I going to apply those things that I learned and and it doesn't matter where the learnings come from it could be just that we've had a day at work that has been particularly insightful it's about having a reflective uh, an opportunity to reflect and that reflective practice having an impact on what you do next good thank you let's see the answers sweater let's uh, let's see what the audience are thinking Wow, 71% mentoring and coaching. I'm, I'm, I'm almost overjoyed at that because I spend so much of my time involved in those activities, both for CIWM, where I'm an active mentor, for ISWA, where I'm currently mentoring people in Australia and the US, which is quite fascinating when they tell me about their local context and I shake my head. <laughs> why, why is it like that? Um, that's fantastic. Brilliant on the job. Yeah, Amy is currently a, a mentee of mine. So uh, hopefully she's having a good time, but I'll let her answer that in a moment. Interesting though, so few people have, have, have identified volunteering. Um, and yet I've seen that be really effective for certain people when they need to go and get a certain skill set. And they've gone, do you know what? I'm going to use some of my spare time to, to get that to get that kind of skill set. A Amy, what's your experiences on that kind of reflecting on those responses? I, like you, Adam, I was pleasantly surprised to see such great um, feedback from mentoring. Uh, but for me personally, um, I've had a really positive experience with uh, mentoring yourself. And I'm not just saying that because you're chairing the panel today, I promise. Um, I, I personally find volunteering, I volunteered with Rally International in Central America for three months. And that for me, well, we talked about the soft skills earlier, completely changed um, who I am as a person. I means now I can pretty much talk to anyone. If anyone meets me, they'll know I can talk the tail off a donkey. Um, but also saw a completely different um, perspective and way of life. And I wouldn't be who I am today without that three month experience. So I'm a big, big uh, believer in volunteering, not only globally, but also in your local community. Fabulous. Right. Let's go for some quick fire because we've got a few questions and the audience are getting a bit, bit disruptive now. They want their answers. So here we go. Ready. Um, is CIW making any plans for the likely environmental migrants that happen on the back of climate change, uh, post Brexit, et cetera, et cetera? New skills, new opportunities, bigger risks. Any thoughts on that, Katie? Is, is that in the melting pot of issues? It is in the melting pot of issues it's definitely in the conversations when we're thinking about our sort of 22 to 25 strategic planning um, fabulous thank you good question joe by the way well done um next one we've got a sector that, that's based on tonnage or percentages or both which clearly is a bit old school and is holding us back um but all that positive beneficial innovative reuse repair up you know recycle um more importantly reduction initiatives happens below the surface you never really see it in the data so how can we identify best practice amy uh, how do we share it how do we make sure there's more of it you know, what any any thoughts on that i think you know our re reuse shops that we've been working in in greater manchester and also in surrey so for those of you who don't know, it's both in the northeast and the southwest, uh, southwest of the UK, are uh, you know great, great news stories, great storytelling for the ability to uh, the reuse reduction stories within our communities. But I think again, this comes back to data. You know, if we if we are engaging and we're getting the right data, we're tracking it from the beginning, and we're sh demonstrating that data out, we can create a stronger, more compelling story. 
Good. A um, couple more quick questions then. Let's think about a small island location. Everything is, is imported. Lots of waste streams. Uh, how can we support somebody like that, uh, Katie? I mean, is what we're doing replicable or do we need to contextualize it much, much more, in which case it's going to come, but it's going to take time? We absolutely have to understand the specific conditions that we're working within. Um, and so, yes, it does need contextualization, and that will require support from local authorities, local governments, um, in collaboration, yes, with, with the membership of CRWM and, and, and decision makers there as well. Um, but no, it can't just be done as a catch all. Good point. Good point. And, and to answer the question from my perspective, I, I once spent quite a lot of time on, on, on Koh Samui developing an integrated environmental strategy for them. Um, and it involved an awful lot of stakeholder engagement and empowerment. We did an awful lot of training and then the mayor changed uh, and everything stopped, um, which is the frustration of the local politics of many of the countries that I used to work in with my previous hat on. It's um, it seemed like a good idea, but politically it was a hot potato. Um, and I think we've got to be careful that, you know, embedding effort into into geographies can be quite risky. Um, but I think, you know, all geographies are going to have to, you know, embrace circular economy in some format. Otherwise, their carbon footprint is going to kind of escalate out of control so good question that one um we've had a we've had a couple of questions uh from from, from robert thanks for these he's interested in sort of uh, repair uh, uh sme support work um uh, you know setting standards almost uh, creating a business model would ciwm be interested in in you know having a look at that partnering with that katie yeah i think i've met with robert and had a conversation about this i think it's definitely worth something that you know a discussion, discussion offline good um and I would support that with my presidential chain on. I think, you know, we're at the moment, we're still in learning mode. Uh, we, we're not sitting here professing to have the answers. What we know is there's a journey to go on and we want to get people around the table, inside the machine, sharing their experiences, because I think there's going to be some real game changing opportunities coming up around skills because the circular economy is going to rapidly, rapidly take off. Um, and, and those of us that are Luddites and still think it's about percentages and landfill and, and energy recovery will find ourselves marginalised very quickly. So uh, get on the journey, everybody. I'm conscious of time. Um, some really good points here about mentoring. Yeah, I don't be shy. See, I has got a great mentoring platform. Iswa's got a great mentoring platform. If in doubt, just ask somebody to be your mentor. You'd be surprised how they often say yes. So email them. By all means, you can find my email, um, well, somewhere. Look me up on LinkedIn. Um, other mentors are available. I do have a limited amount of spare capacity right now. Um, lots of conversation about politics, politicians. Yeah, we do need to work on those. Absolutely agree. Well done, everybody, for identifying those. Uh, and, and, and I think we haven't really talked about the public a lot. Um, and yeah, rightly, it's not really the remit of CIWM or B-Waste Wise or, or Suez even to, to, to try and engage the public directly on circular economy. But we do need to recognise that skills gaps, and that's why I think the communication and education was raised so frequently in, in, in many of the polls that we put on. If we can't get my mum to go, oh, I'm going to use refill and take back and everything else, then kind of we're missing the point, aren't we? We're going to continually have materials to manage. So really good opportunity there to think about our role as communicators, innovators, uh, agents of change, nudge, uh, you know, nudge behavioralists, if you like. So uh, great opportunity. Listen, audience, you've been fantastic. I'm conscious of time. Great questions. Can I let the panel have the final word, though? Uh, Katie, give me a takeaway message, a hashtag, uh, 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 you know, some kind of phrase that is going to haunt me for the next two years on social media. No pressure. Um, you have to return to that theme of accountability. I think you're going to have to be a as a society. Oh, sorry, Katie. Katie sorry, to... Mike. We lost that. Try again. Can you hear me? Yeah, talking to the mic. Good. <laughs> how it works <laughs> sorry, sorry um I said, I said i think we have to circle back to that theme of adaptability i think we're going to need to make sure that we're adaptable as people we're adaptable as a sector we're adaptable as a society and if we can't achieve that we won't achieve a secular economy i think it's about constant adaptability. hashtag adaptable i'm having that one amy give me a takeaway message please uh, embrace the change it's coming <laughs> 
I might have heard that somewhere before. It sounds like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, but anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll have that one because you're right. The, the only constant is change, to quote my CEO, by the way. Um, it's, um, it's a recurring theme, isn't it? We, we have to recognise that the world is changing around us and, and I don't want to be a Luddite, nor do I want to be a dinosaur. So hence why I'm embracing the fact that I, get, I need to reskill. I, you know, I want to still be you know, contributing to the economy and protecting the planet in five years from now. I don't want to be out to pasture. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Sweater, thank you for the platform. Um, fantastic, as always. I, I really do enjoy the Be Waste Wise conversations. Um, I, I'm never sure who's going to be in the audience, and I'm, I, I'm always uncertain about what questions they're going to raise. So another great session, and, and uh, thank you for letting me host again. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it, and hopefully everybody got something out of it, and I wish you all well. See you on a, a future session. Sweater, back to you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Amy. Thanks a lot to the audience. Uh, we did receive a lot of messages and clearly a lot of people enjoyed the event. So this is for the audience. Next week, Adam is going to host another webinar on Be Waste Wise. So please go to the website, sign up for, uh, register for that webinar, and you will see Adam once again next week. Bye-bye. Have a good day wherever you're at. Take care. Bye-bye.